I'm Leah Borromeo and I'm here with Alka Schmidt at the William Morris Gallery in London's Walthamstow. Uh, Alka's work is currently on display in a show called Tangled Yarns. Alka's work basically tackles all of the processes and the politics behind the fabric that makes up the clothes that go on our backs. Yeah, I mean, you, you and I are both, we both do kind of work on a similar subject. Uh, definitely not similar work. I, I, I would actually camp artists and journalists all in the same camp because what we do for a living is just basically ask questions. I think maybe the first thing to say is just uh, by, by ways of background that um, for me I'm finding myself always having this double role as an um, artist, as a maker and also as a critical citizen, as somebody who uh, wants to interact with other people in society and comment on things that bother me or annoy me. When you pick the particular subjects that you have, and there, there are loads of other ones about you know, child labour in Uzbek cotton, um, Cambodian workers or Vietnamese workers and all sorts of other things, is it, do you deliberately set out to do a piece about that or is it something that you suddenly read about and become enraged over and suddenly think, okay, I need to say something about this. I think it's a bit of both. Um, with the, um, like I said, with the contemporary, I've been looking at both Bangladesh and Uzbekistan. I've been following that for years and making artwork about it, mostly about the Bangladesh side of things for some time. Who created this demand for cotton? Who created this demand that cotton should be the fabric. Who fetishizes this idea that we have to continually produce clothes upon clothes upon clothes? Like, was it eight and a half billion articles of clothes in the UK per year alone? You know, there's about eight and a half billion people on the planet. So that's one you know, article of clothing for every person on the planet, but only to fit on this island. Yeah. And then 350,000 to 400,000 tons of that goes straight into a landfill when we, we get bored of it. There's something quite irrational there in, in some respect. Why is there suddenly not like two seasons in the shops, but every four, six weeks? But, you know, who's responsible for that? Is it the marketing but people? Yeah, is it the brands? Uh, yeah, is because it why is it even cool to wear a new thing all the time? Well, that's also, that, that has more to do psychologically with this sort of I idea, the, the, the idea or the, the illusion of wealth and prosperity. Yes. Because if you're always wearing the same thing all the time, then you're considered poor, then therefore, you know, but if you're actually wearing something different all the time, it means you've got money to burn and you can do that. Shall, we, shall we call it sort of like late capitalism? You know, yeah, it's like just my, um, this whole thing that everything is for sale, everything, and that people are defined by what they buy and what they have, not by what they are. The whole idea of having an ethical fashion label is it's, it's like sort of you know, military intelligence or jumbo shrimp. You know, it, just, it doesn't really tend to work together. They're, they're, they're complete oxymorons. And, and it's like, but you have a label that's meant to be ethical, yet you're trying to push me to go and buy something. The question surely shouldn't be what I'm buying, but whether I should even be buying at all. Okay, so welcome to London Fashion Week. Does it matter to you where something comes from when you buy something, or is it is it the style you look at first, or is, there, is it the price, um, or what do you actually do when you, when you go shopping? Completely honest, I literally just look at how it looks. It's sort of like you have to look good um, in fashion. If I were to hear that something was specifically like bad in terms of ethical, like the way it's produced and things, then I'd be slightly more averse to buying it. But if I don't really know, then if, if, if there's no one there to tell me, then still get it anyway, I guess. If I was made aware mm. that, you know, six unraised children had made that piece of fabric, then... Yeah, then you'd be slightly... Yeah, yeah, you know, more... Um, you can't not ignore it. Yeah, you, you wouldn't yeah. ignore it. So Rana Plaza in, in Bangladesh, where thousands upon thousands of workers um, died through a building collapse, which killed, what is it, 1,139 uh, workers could have been completely and totally avoidable. I found that quite 
you know, one of the most shocking aspects of the whole thing, that it was entirely avoidable. Um, if you think about that building, or the pillars weren't strong enough, the concrete was the wrong concrete, probably didn't use enough steel. And so, you know, like one fine day, um, the workers see these huge cracks in the building. And of course they get scared and they all walk out. Their supervisors there, they went like, what do you mean walk out? I'm going to lose my contract if I don't deliver, which means you're going to be losing your job if you don't show up. They were very scared. But they did go back in because they needed the money. So you got 2,400 sewing machines going and two huge gen generators in an already crumbling building. That was it. That was the death knell. It vibrated. And within a minute, it all collapsed. And you, know, and you could see it was cutting, cutting corners and pressure all the way. What I wanted to do is to, well, part of it just make a memorial for the people who died because I didn't want them to be forgotten. So then the next question was, how do I, how does this look like a memorial for the dead workers? And at the same time, I was really, really quite fascinated seeing images from the site itself, from the chaos at the site with all the steel sticking out and the fabrics and the bodies and the sand and the concrete and, you know, just this complete chaos. And then uh, the other pieces where I developed this idea, I want one thing to represent each worker who died. And I want one thing that relates to what they are doing. They are um, they're needle workers. So I came up with a sewing pin. I took great pains to count my pins that I actually did have 1138. Because I thought, well, it's important. Because if I say one pin for each person, I don't want anyone to be left out. Did a man, did a man. Now that we're kind of along the whole sort of supply chain line, where did all of the materials come from your work? Um, oh yes, good, good question. I wanted to do something about child labour, which is, it seems just in the last couple of years now, declining in Uz Uzbek cotton harvesting, even though the forced labour component is still very big. I wanted to have that fabric for children by children, in a way. So I looked for a nice cotton fabric with child motifs and the one that I used had this nice marketing thing on it which said um, you can use this fabric, it's, it's eco-certified, no toxic dyes were used or to toxic materials were used in the printing process so children wouldn't be exposed to those cotton cottons, even babies. And I thought, oh, this is very nice, we're thinking about the, the back end of things but nobody has been thinking about where this fabric uh, was coming from. I mean, this is the, this is the other thing that I've, I've discovered through making my own film, is traveling through India and, and going and following the entire sort of, everything from seed through to shop and then finding out who makes the bloody seed. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and going through that whole process is this way that you can very easily, very early on, muddle up where everything comes from. Now, back in the factory where they were making the shirt, they'd signed up to say, you know, this brand says there will be no child labor involved, or this brand says there will be no exploitation of this, these are our working hours, this is how much we get paid. And then when you get to the ginning part of it, and then the cotton picking part, and the whole sort of harvesting and the farming thing, yes, of course there are children that are involved there, because these are families that are doing it, they're small-scale landholders. And there is a huge traceability issue. So. Um, politically, I think the fact that over, what was it, 150, 180 brands had signed up to not knowingly, um, you know, use Uzbek cotton. It was politically, um, I think, a massively influential move. Practically, the knowingly is the key word because they would have used some of it unknowingly anyway. But it's, 
is that transparency actually practicable, practicable um, when we're running around knowing full well that there are workers that are being exploited on one hand, there are farmers that are, that are killing themselves to get out of debt on the other hand, um, there are children that are being used over here. I mean, it's just this whole system that is being fed through an exploitation. And, and, and then there comes the point where I think it's nice to think that it will be stable. And of course, that's the big illusion with capitalism. The minute you uh, stop taking your eye off the ball, there's the backlash and there's the downward pressure again. And you know, everything goes back down, down, down. A lot of people seem to be very resigned at the moment. That that's just the way it is. There is no point fighting. There is nothing we can do about it. Yes, you can. <laughs> जेव्हा मग ते त्यानं आत्महत्या केली जेव्हा मग ती पोलीस पुरा चौकात झाली तेव्हा को चिट्ट्या सापडल्या वाटते खिशामध्ये तेव्हा माहीत झालं का एवढ्या अजून धरकराचं कर्ज आहे बा म्हणून नाही झालं माफ तरी कधी कधी चक्कर मारते पण आमच्या घरी तरी पण मी म्हणतो कधी कधी यायले ज्या आईनं घेते त्यायले मागा म्हणते मेले तुमच्या कर्जासाठी म्हणतो मला मागता का म्हणतो